Okay, so here's a story about celebrity. It starts in Italy in the years before World War II, when the country was controlled by Benito Mussolini. Aside from being a murderous fascist and dictator, Mussolini was an avid movie fan and fanboy of film stars, going so far as to write more than a hundred fawning letters to American actress Anita Page, including several marriage proposals. Yeah, he was that guy. Mussolini knew the emotional power of cinema as a tool for propaganda and building cultural prestige. So when the Roman production facility Cine Studios burned down in 1935, Mussolini used it as an opportunity to build the largest film studio in Europe, called Cinecittà, a sprawling 4.3 million square foot complex on the southeast edge of Rome. For its first few years, Cinecittà turned out a number of mediocre nationalist films until... There lies the eternal city, poorly defended, helpless to stop the attack. Just six years after it opened, Cinecittà was partly destroyed in the Allied bombing of Rome in 43 and 44. After the war, the Allies requisitioned the studio and turned it into a displaced persons camp, where thousands of refugees lived on the massive sound stages of a defunct dream and propaganda factory. The studio space being used and Mussolini's thumb removed, a new wave of filmmakers took to the streets of Rome Rome to make movies about real life in post-war Italy. These neo-realist films, as they were dubbed, like Rome, Open City by Roberto Rossellini and Bicycle Thieves by Vittorio De Sica, were internationally successful, critically and commercially, situating Rome as a capital of world cinema, something Mussolini wanted but could never achieve. This, in turn, helped to reopen Cinecittà and bring in big budget productions like Quo Vadis from 1949, in which some of the last refugees are likely mixed in with the waves of extras. Quo Vadis was the first of many movies Hollywood would produce in Rome, thanks to cheap labor costs, the sheer size of Cinecittà, and the romantic allure of the Eternal City, sword and sandal epics like Ben-Hur and Cleopatra that were massively successful and provided great return on investment. The only problem was recently passed Italian law stated that earnings made from productions in Italy had to stay in Italy. So what did Hollywood studios do with all that cash stranded overseas? They reinvested it in more movies. So began a legendary period in movie history, called by one Time Magazine reporter, Hollywood on the Tiber. The set of circumstances I described above brought film star after film star to the cobbled streets of Rome, merging their glamour with the mystique of a city that was rapidly recovering from fascism and war. For a few years, the Via Veneto was the coolest place in the world. Of course, this was only one side of Rome in the 50s. While the glitterati cavorted in chic bars and clubs, thousands of others struggled to find their place in the post-war economy. A few of these, unable to land steady work, picked up a camera and began taking freelance pictures for tourists, but soon found they could make even more money snapping photos of celebrities. One of these photographers was Tazio Secchiaroli, known as the Fox of Via Veneto. One November night in 1958, Tazio found his way into Rugentino, a restaurant in Trastevere, where a high-profile party was in full swing. The actress Anita Ekberg was there, drinking, having a good time. She kicked off her shoes and began to dance barefoot in front of a jazz band. Then, out of nowhere, an uninvited guest took to the floor and proceeded to strip in front of a shocked but enthusiastic crowd of elites. Tazio snapped a photo. The next day, all the biggest tabloids ran with the story. Even the New York Times reported on it. It became clear to Tazio and his compatriots that scandal pays, so they sought it out 
hiding in corners, sneaking into parties and backlots. And if they couldn't find bad behavior, they created it, provoking celebrities to attack them. And it worked. Then something interesting happened. The Italian filmmaker Federico Fellini reached out to Tazio and asked him for stories of his trade. So Tazio obliged, and a year later, Fellini made La Dolce Vita, The Sweet Life, one of the best movies of all time, which immortalized the Hollywood on the Tiber era and the ravenous photographers who captured it. Fellini based the main photographer on Tazio himself and called him Paparazzo. The name, as we all know, stuck. So did the profession. This period in Rome was a hinge point in the history of celebrity. Paparazzi disrupted the highly manicured image movie stars had enjoyed since the golden age of Hollywood. They brought these gods of our culture down to the messy earth. Interestingly though, this didn't dampen our obsession with fame, as you might expect. No, it turbocharged it. Something about seeing our celebrities brought low, catching a glimpse of their flaws and pains, it didn't push the famous off these weird pedestals we put them on. It only intensified our fixation with them. Maybe because we saw ourselves in those flaws, and it allowed us to form deeper bonds with them. One-way bonds, that is. Whatever the reason, we're all fanboys now living in a world created 60 years ago on the streets of an ancient city. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. This episode was brought to you by Squarespace. If you don't know, you can use Squarespace to make websites for anything you might need. Want to make a site for your video content? Well, you can upload your video library directly to Squarespace and even sell access to that content. Or you can use the Squarespace Video Studio app to make pro-level videos within Squarespace and host your content on beautiful pages designed with their easy-to-use blogging tools. Basically, a Squarespace site is going to make whatever you're sharing or selling look professional. And that's going to help you get the word out, whatever that word actually is. Head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash nerdwriter for 10% off your first purchase. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time.